John chapter 6, as we read into this again, I want you to remember uh, something that I'm going to point, and if you don't know this, I'm going to point it out to you. John has a, John 6 has an unusual amount of verses in it. Okay? 71, in fact. There are not too many New Testament New Testament books that have 70 verses in it. Not, in fact, I think this is probably the most verses of any New Testament book that there is. I, think there is, I, th I don't think there's another. I don't think any of Matthew's Gospel, Mark, Luke. I don't think the book of Acts has a chapter with 71 verses in it. I don't think any of the letters of Paul or the book of Revelation. I don't think they have nearly that many verses in it. So to me, it comes as no surprise when I look at verse 66. John 6, 66. And it says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Well, that is what's called apostasy. They are reprobates now, their conscience seared with a hot iron. And I want you to kind of just sort of leave that in the back of your mind because again, um, somebody, somebody maybe here or online, look at all the chapters in the New Testament and see if there's another chapter in the New Testament that has more than, let's say, 60 verses in it. I don't believe there is. I think John 6 out of all the chapters in the New Testament, has the most verses in it. And I personally believe that that, that verse, many of his disciples walked, back for, walked no more with him. They went backwards. I think that verse is in that place for a reason. So naturally, there would have had to have been at least more than 66 or 67 verses in chapter 6, or it wouldn't work out. To me, it looks like it belongs there. And I'm just, I just one of these, I believe, the, I believe not only God inspired the Bible, He gave them the exact words, but I believe God preserved the Bible intact, and I believe that God had His hand in its arrangement. I can't believe that God, who has arranged, listen to me, God has arranged every detail of every minute of my life. Has he not yours? Has he not moved in every minute detail in your life? Then why would we expect God to not have anything to do with the working and the putting together of the Bible. Why would God not have anything to do with it? It's a, to me, it's a good question. So I just, I think there's something to it. So maybe if somebody can, can find for me another chapter in the New Testament. Now, Psalms 119 doesn't count. That's Old Testament. Um, but if you can find for me a chapter in the New Testament that has, let's say, more than 60 verses... Well, it just had to be one, didn't there? I had to be wrong, didn't I? Luke 22, also has 71. Luke 22 has 71. Yeah, but they're not chapter 6, though. All right, you got me on that one. I was wrong. I admit it when I'm wrong, especially when I got two people telling me I'm wrong. Yes? Matthew 27 has 66. That's interesting. Yeah, but it doesn't work. It doesn't, it's not 666, though. Okay, anyway. All right, well, let's go back, three, sing three songs, start church all over again. But anyway, understand that as we're reading through John chapter 6, we're headed in that direction. Heading in the direction of John 666, where a, there is a grand departure away from Jesus Christ. And we're living in times right now where we're seeing a grand departure from, um, from the Word of God, from Bible believing, from Bible Christianity, 
so on and so on. There's always going to be an attack on the King James Bible. There's always going to be attack on the pure words of God. And, uh, and I believe this, this kind of go along, goes along with it. So kind of keep that in your mind. Last Wednesday night, we were looking at the feeding of the 5,000. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, uh, when we get to some of these numbers, I told you the number two last Wednesday night in relation to the 200 penny worth. So let's read this again. John chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Remember, the, the, the exact things that Jesus does in this story is going to be important. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. So we looked at last Wednesday night the significance of the number two Anything related to 2, 2, 22, uh, 200, um, 222, 2,000, and so on. Um, that references the age of the Gentiles, the, the 2,000 years that Christ is saving those of the Gentile race. He is saving all of us non-Jews. He's dedicated to us. He loves us. He, we are going to be his bride. He is our husband. And, um, and that's how it's going to be. And so what Philip was saying here in, a, in the prophetic typology language of the Bible, that during the 2000 years, Lord, that's not, that won't save Israel. That time is not sufficient to save Israel. There needs to be a time more than that, and Jesus says, you're right, okay? And there is going to be a time after the two days, the 2,000 years, the day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years, where Christ is going to save Israel. He's going to give them the bread of life. They're going to eat of it freely, just like you and I do. They're going to receive the grace of God. The, the veil of Moses is going to be lifted. They're going to see who the Messiah really was, under that veil, they're going to be able to see him for the first time. They're going to know him. They're going to believe him. God is going to, like Paul, he's going to remove the scales off their eyes. They're, going to, they're partially blinded now. Then they're going to see fully during those years. They're going to understand that Christ, they're not going to argue with God about it. And God's going to forgive all of their sins. Just boom, just like that. He's going to forgive their sins. He's going to, and he's going to restore to them double for the things they've done. He's going to give them what Elisha asked for, the double portion of the Spirit that Elijah had. That's the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you see in Acts chapter 2, prophesied in Joel chapter 2. So now, now we looked at two not sufficient. Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. They're all types of Israel and the Gentiles. Joseph marries a Gentile bride, has two sons, feeds his brethren after 22 years. And they don't know him be during that time. They don't know who he is. But in the 22nd year, 22 is the number for revelation. When Joseph finally says, it is I, Joseph, your brother, be, be not afraid. They're, then they, they saw him for the first time. Then they knew who he was. And at first they were afraid, but he said, fear not for what you did, unto, what you, uh, what you meant me for evil God meant to you for good to save you alive during this time Joseph could see the handiwork of God the plan of God and he was glad to be part of it and he meant what he said I mean you absolutely no harm I'm here to save you go get daddy as soon as possible and uh, can you imagine after 22 years of those boys lying to their dad about what happened to Joseph Having to go back to their dad and say, uh, Dad, 
<clears throat> How's it going? Arthritis getting you? Yeah? Well, Dad, we've got something to tell you. Um, it's kind of funny. Remember that day when we came in and told you Joseph got killed by a beast and you know, tore his coat to shreds and we brought the coat to you and had blood all over it? Um, well, we lied. <laughs> Isn't it funny, Dad? We lied. Joseph is alive in Egypt and he's got bread to save us all. Amen. Joshua marches the ark 2,000 cubits in front of Israel at the River Jordan. And then Hosea 6, 2, after two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up again. Uh, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Incidentally, in that NIV life application study Bible that I bought for my wife years ago when I was stupid, it had scripture in it, which was all wrong scripture. And then it had comments under the scripture, which the comments were worse than the scripture, if you can believe that. And Melissa, what it said under Hosea 6.2, when you look at Hosea 6.2, you see this great promise that God, after two days, is going to revive Israel. It's a glorious promise. Amen? You know what the commentary said? That this was the arrogance of the Jews of the day thinking that God was going to restore them when God had no such plans of restoring them. And it was and it was at that point that I decided I wasn't ever again going to look to a commentary for understanding the Bible. Cuz I thought if they can lie about something like that, what else are they going to lie about? You don't trust commentaries. Don't do it. All right. Now, um, let's study this for a few minutes. John 6, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight in Jesus name. Amen. John chapter 6, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there's a lad here which hath how many barley loaves? Five and two small fishes. How many pieces of food all together do we have? Seven. So what is that number? What do you think that number means in this story? What do you think that represents? Huh? Well, that's, that's what the number means. Okay. So just kind of think about that's what he's feeding them is seven things okay this the seven spirits of God keep going I'm gonna make you all think tonight since there ain't many of you here you guys are gonna get that's the number eight he's feeding them seven things What else is related to the number seven in the Bible? How about the words of the Lord are pure words as silver purified seven times. Okay. So he's feeding them his pure Perfected, kept, preserved word. He's feeding that to them. Seven things, five loaves, two fishes. Because you've got to have, if you're going to have a fish sandwich, it's got to have fish and sandwich. Right? Okay. And everybody had a fish sandwich on that day. So now, so now you understand that part of it. There's seven things here that he feeds them. He blesses it. Anything God blesses, doesn't matter how small it is. Doesn't matter how small it is. God blesses it. 
Okay, from the smallest church to the smallest family to the smallest, most insignificant person in a church, God can use that person and bless them in a mighty, mighty big way. God can do that. So, the five barley loaves, two small fishes, uh, what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now, so let me ask you this. Why, why doesn't the Bible give you the total number of people? Because we know there's more than just the men. We know there's the men, their wives, some of the men may not have been married, uh, but we know we have the wives there, and we know we have the children. We don't know exactly how many children each family had, so it could be one child, two children, three children, five children, a dozen children. Could be like the Duggars, it could be 20 children. Okay, who knows? So we could have 20, 30,000 people here, but the focus, the specific focus of the scripture is on the 5,000. The Bible's just going out of its way. And I learned, I learned this when I first started studying it. It just seemed like God had to go out of his way to make this number present in this passage. He had to tell you that it's like when he's talking about Goliath. Why does he tell you that uh, his spearhead weighs 600 shekels? Why does it tell you he is six cubits? Why does it tell you that his brother had six fingers and six toes? Why does it, why does it tell you that David picked up five rocks out of the brook? Why didn't it just say a handful and put it in there? Because when he puts the number there, the number tells you something about how it fits into a, a prophetic picture. How it fits in God's prophecy uh, layout and the things that he's going to do. So if you were to just ponder this for a minute, which I've kind of wasted time a little bit to give you time to think about why is there 5,000 mentioned here? Give me a response to that. Why would there be only 5,000 men mentioned here? Why is that significant? What, is, what would it mean as far as what the number can mean? Yes. Okay. He is going to extend his grace. Fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? But what does the five, what does the number five at its core represent? What is it, its base understanding, if you were to go to Genesis 5 and look at that number, what would you see there? You should look at Genesis 5. Okay. Sometimes I, you know, it's, it's been a while since I taught numbers. And it's because it's my assumption that I know them. And so you all have heard me for years. You should know them all like I know them all. But you, you don't. I mean, I've got them all in my head all the time. And I just see things and just things just jump out in the text to me. I count and I'm still to this day, I'm counting things. I'm not planning on writing a new book on numbers, but I still to this day, I'm counting things. And if I find it significant, I put it in my notes. So what does, oh, I got somebody. Oh, how you doing? There you go, David Taylor. Okay, you get a free download from YouTube. Okay, so in Genesis 5, Adam, 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 Adam. 
And the fifth time he's mentioned, and all the days of Adam were 930 years, and he... So what does five mean at its base? Death. Okay? Yeah, Olivia! And see, they're a minute behind us. So they're not hearing this yet. Okay? No, just death. Okay? These are Jews. How many books did Moses write? Five. The Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So these people were appointed to death. The Jews were dead because their, their bones scattered in the wilderness. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are dead because the law made them dead. They follow the law. Therefore, their works are dead works. They think that by doing these works, they can achieve righteousness. By the way, the, the shush lady in Las Vegas, she, her, her whole doctrine um, was in total opposition to the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Because her doctrine of reincarnation said that if you lived a sinful life, then God judged you, and then you had to live a better life doing more good works during that life to better yourself for the next life that you were going to give until finally you reached a point to where you lived a perfected life and then you ascended to gain nothing, which is nirvana. Nirvana means nothing. You get nothing in their version of heaven, yes. What, of reincarnation? It comes out of Hindu doctrine. It comes out of Oriental mysticism. It comes out of a lot of the Oriental religions. Buddhism, Hinduism, they all teach reincarnation. Okay? That you live a if you live a bad life, then the next life you get, you're born in the slums, you're born a dark color, you can't get a job, you're going to live in poverty all your life, you're going to be beat on, you're going to be abused, you're going to be raped, molested, you're going to, and you're going to deserve every bit of it, and it's your lot. And to this day, people that live in India, and there are some who are trying to bring them out of that, who don't believe in all the 330 million gods that they worship, but still and yet it is so ingrained in the Indian people that if you're born in the slums and you're of real dark skin, you deserve it. It's your fault. You deserved it. You did something in your past life that put you in that spot, and we're not about to we're not we're not about to to change your karma. That's up to you. So that's where it comes from. So yes, these 5,000 are in death. Jesus has compassion on them. and he's got, So what else then is related to the number five? How about this one? Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Who is their God? Well, guess what? How art thou fallen from heaven? Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five, I will be like the most high. 
but yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Because Lucifer has these five things in his heart, God has turned him over now to everlasting death in hell, and eventually he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? What else is associated with the number five? Um, I mentioned earlier, David picked up how many stones? Five. Five of those stones. What were the commandments written on? Stone. Okay? Um, and he brings death to Goliath, who is a type of the devil and the Antichrist, who has the power of death, Goliath could have killed every Jew in that valley. He had the power to do it, and none had the power to resist him. There wasn't any that had the power to stand against him, and they were all doomed to death. So then we look at 1 Thessalonians 4. This is God's promise to us that we will either we will either die and and be resurrected or if we are alive we won't die. And he says it like this, 1 Thessalonians 4:16 for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Five things happen here. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. Turn there. It's exactly five things that Paul mentions here. I'm not sure that Paul was necessarily aware that that's why he was writing it the way he was, but the Holy Ghost was aware of it. So he says in uh, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. And here it is. Number one, we shall not all sleep. Number two, but we shall all be changed. Number three, in a moment. Number four, in the twinkling of an eye. Number five, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And so it has to do, the reason why there's 5,000 being fed with five barley loaves is that these people are, are going to die. They're following Jesus and yet they have no food and there isn't enough. Number one, Philip is making an appraisal here and he's saying, uh, Lord, we don't have this much money, but even if we did, we could, if we had 200 penny worth, we could not buy enough food for every one of these people to have but a little. And so that what he's telling you there, one thing he's telling you there is that their salvation is not coming from us. And I want to say this, uh, I appreciate, listen, I, I cannot thank you people enough for the way you've responded to the needs that we have in Kenya. Someone blessed us with a pretty good donation today. And uh, I just want to say, if you're watching, thank you. But then you turn around and you give that thanks to Jesus. Because we can't save people. We can't change their life. We are not capable of doing it. Only God can do that. Only God can. So even if they had all the money to buy the food that they had, it wouldn't be enough. So how is it that God keeps feeding all of these people in Kenya? I'll be honest with you, I have no idea. But he does. He keeps doing it, 
And there's some months I, I, I think, boy, we're not doing so hot financially. And yet we give, we give to the orphanage uh, for Brother Sam Cotavaticani. We give him uh, a portion of, of the money we take in every month. We give him a portion of it. We give Pastor Lordson Rock a portion of it. Both of them are trying to feed poor people in India, and he's start, trying to start an orphanage there. And so we're trying to share some of the things that God has blessed us with. But then we just keep feeding people. Michael says, can we, can we do another feeding? And I just go, okay, go ahead. And the money just shows up, boom. And so I'm telling you, God will tell us, you can't do it. But I can. I'm the God who feeds all the sparrows, all the turtles. You know all those fish that you go fishing for? Did you know that they're not, their diet does not consist solely of bait? They eat things in the water. God feeds them there and does a pretty good job of it. God feeds every form of life in this world. And God knows how to feed people. Amen. So here we have people who were appointed to death. And now, now, verse 11, Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. We talked what about that meant last week. They were gathered together and, and filled 12 baskets. So what does that 12 represent? So we know we're talking about Israel, 12 tribes. And 12 apostles, we're, we're going to be gathered to. But what else does the number 12 represent? The stars of the sky. That one of these days God is going to take us from this earth, take us up, change our vile mortal bodies, to a body that is like unto Jesus Christ, glorified body, and we will be as the angels of heaven, we will shine forth as lights in the world, we will take the place of the one-third of the angels that have been kicked out, we're going to shine as the stars of heaven. Somebody say amen. That's what that means, that's why that 12 is there. It's a beautiful picture. Of God. Number one, if you want to just apply it to yourself, how you were dead in trespasses and sins, but you had heard about a man named Jesus, and you wanted to listen to this man, and not only, not only did you hear the gospel, but you saw this man do a miracle in feeding you and feeding thousands of others, and you didn't think that was possible, and he did a miracle in your life. And now you're fed. Now there's way more food than what they had started with. And now they're gathering up the fragments. Let me run through those verses very quickly for you tonight. Genesis 49.10 The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Who is Shiloh? It's not John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. Shiloh is Jesus, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. We're all going to be Jew, Gentile alike. We are going to be gathered together to be with our shepherd, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 31, 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Notice here what they're gathered for, that they may hear, that they may learn, 
and that they may fear and observe. Four things. That's the gospel. See, I'm not done counting things. I still count them. I look at that and I'm going, that's perfect. It's exactly what God's going to do. First Chronicles 11, 1. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David and to Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Look at, look at what they're saying to David. We're your body. We're your body. What did Adam say when God brought Eve to him? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And look what Israel is saying to David, their king. Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And so all of those bones scattered all out in the wilderness, what's God's going to do? You're going to gather them together, put sinew on them, put muscle on them, put skin on them, breathe the breath of life into them. They're going to stand up a mighty army. Not reincarnated! First Chronicles 16, 35. And say ye, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Don't you think that God wants his people gathered together? Now, I'm not preaching to you five people that are here. I'm preaching to all you other ones that ain't, that can be here. God wants us gathered, not forsaking, what? The gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. I get calls Every now and then, very quick calls from people who say, Pastor, I know your time is valuable. I just got one thing to say to you. We thank God for you. Our family prays for you every day. We appreciate your work, your labor, your ministry. We've learned so much. We thank God for you. Keep doing it. And there's been some days that's all I needed. Keep going. So when you voluntarily dismiss yourself from gathering together, it just, it does something. It's not the same. Now I know you folks that are out beyond living here online, this is the best that we can do. I, I get that. And you hear me pray, to you, pray for you all the time. God will give you a double portion. And I really mean that. But if you're here in the area, you come to church. It's nothing like it. Second Chronicles 20 verse 4, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. They gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Psalm 50 verse 5, Gather my, Look at this, Gather my saints together. Unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. That's Christ's sacrifice. Psalm 106, 47. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. I'm praying, God, deliver me from Las Vegas, Nevada. Get me out of that city. Amen. Get me out of there. Psalm uh, 147, 2, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcasts of Israel. Isaiah eleven twelve. he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. Look, that's twice now we've seen that. Psalm 147 and Isaiah 11, gather together the outcasts, assemble the outcasts. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The people that nobody else wanted. We'll take them. And I'm going to say this. 
I'll take them as God brings them to me. God may bring them here in a very broken down, messed up way. And their ways and their nature is not right. But if God brings them here, let's pray for them, let's minister to them, let's teach them how to grow in the Lord so that God can work change in their life. Let God, and let God work the change because if we try to change them, it'll mess, we'll mess it up. And then Isaiah 54, 5. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Boy, that's good stuff, isn't it? He said, for a small moment have I forsaken thee. Yeah, God will get angry with you and he'll put you out about an arm's length distance from him and just to get you to think now, think about where your life is without God helping you. And when you've had enough of that, you cry God will reach over and grab you and pull you back in and say, with great mercies will I gather thee and I'll have mercy and pardon on you and I'll forgive you and I'll love you and I'll wipe away all you. I'll take this hand and I'll whoop the daylights out of you and make you cry and then when I've made you cry, I'll take that hand and wipe the tears off of your eyes and say, hush baby, don't cry no more. Amen. My God's done that with me many a times. He'll do it for you too if He loves you. He'll do it for you. But the gathering together of the saints is what Jesus is getting at here. That when He says, gather the fragments that none be lost. There's a gathering coming. I see two things happening. One, I believe God is going to gather together His outcasts. And this is going to be people from a lot of different denominations, a lot of different movements, a lot of different theologies, a lot of different things. He's going to gather us together. You might as well get ready for that and get used to it. Number two, I believe this world is going to start being gathered. In fact, they are. I think the process has already started of the devil gathering everybody together electronically. Don't you think that? I think that. I think at some point, if you are not hooked in digitally, you will not be able to eat. I think that day's coming. Why are they telling us that they're out of change? I don't buy it. I don't believe it. All of a sudden now, oh, we've got to take electronic payments only. It's, they can track it or shut it down if they want to. That is exactly right. Here come, here come us cattle. Move through the cattle gates. Doing whatever they tell us to do. Mm, mm, mm. 